church, let's stand and sing this morning together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when I find, I fight on my knees, my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. can be against me for Jesus there's nothing impossible for you when all I see are the ashes you see the beauty when all I see Cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees, my hands lifted I Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And Almighty Fortress, oh, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine. Shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear. All right. Hey, what a good way to start off the morning. How are you today? Good. It's good to see you. Welcome to our online crew. It's Communion Sunday, as you can see here. So our online folks, gather your elements at home. We'll be partaking pretty soon here. Uh, but before we continue in worship, we'd love for you to turn around, say hi to somebody, learn a name. Uh, welcome to church.
Amen. Uh, you can have a seat. We're going to move into uh, a time of communion. And this is, um, I don't know, this is special to my heart as we get to do this. We only get to do it once a month, but here we are. And uh, I, I really enjoy this time. Um, and we do this as individuals. We do this as a community uh, because of what Jesus said. When he was in the upper room with his disciples, the Last Supper, he took the bread, he passed it around, he said, this is my body broken for you, do this remembrance of me. Same way he took the cup, he passed that around and said, this is my blood shed for you, do this in remembrance of me. Soon after then, he was betrayed, went through trial, crucified, and then rose again. And that's why we do it, because Jesus isn't in the grave, he's alive, he changes our lives right now, and we get to remember that. And so you don't have to be a part of, uh, you don't have to be a member here at Montrose Church. I just simply ask that you have um, prayed a prayer of confession, accepted Jesus as Savior. And um, we're going to pass the elements out. Our ushers will pass them out in just a moment here. We ask you to hold those. Uh, the band's going to play a song, and you can take that time however you want. If you want to sing along with the band and, you know, express those words, awesome. If you want to sit in silence and have a time of confession before God, say, hey, I need you. This is, this is a, a reminder to me personally that I need your help day in and day out and confess those sins. Do that. If you just want to sit in silence and just absorb what's going on, awesome. And then I'll lead us as we'll partake together as a community. So uh, I'm going to invite the ushers forward and they're going to pass out the elements uh, and uh, we'll get to communion here in just a minute. God, we love you. We pray over these elements. God, there's nothing particularly special about the cracker and the juice that's passed out. What's special is the practice that we're remembering you. Thank you for your saving work on the cross. Uh, we take this time to remember that. In your name, amen.
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, passed it to his disciples and said, take this and eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. In the same way, he passed the cup, and said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you that you are not dead, that you are alive, that you wash over us, that you make us new. God, we ask that that would be true today, that you would chip away the things that are uh, not of you, and you would form and you would shape us to be more and more like who you are, that we would go from this place, there would be lights in this world. God, we... Uh, lift up the needs that are represented here uh, and in, on our online congregation, God. We know that there's things that are uh, paths that, that we're going, walking through that are, that are difficult, and God, we need you. We know that there's also good stuff that's happening, God, so we celebrate that along with our brothers and sisters. We love you. We look forward to what you're going to continue to do in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. My name is Austin, one of the pastors here at Montrose Church. So glad that you are here with us. If this is your first time visiting with us, uh, love that you're here. Hope that you get a little flavor of what Montrose Church is about. We'd love to get to know you more. Uh, would you pull me aside or one of the pastors aside afterwards and uh, say hi, introduce yourself? Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, we don't hand out a physical bulletin here. We do this all digitally, and so we've got this QR code up on screen. So if you want to uh, scan that with your camera, it'll take you right to our Right Now page. And there's a bunch of stuff that's listed there uh, that's coming up. And man, it is almost summer, and we are rolling. We are moving into summer. Uh, it's going. And so I want to highlight a few of those things. Oh, also, if you're new here and you don't know, we have a parking lot that we rent, like, right around the corner here. And so if you want to park there, like, you can drop your person off here and go park. There's, like... 100 spots there. There's a lot of parking. I know it's tough with the uh, uh, arts and crafts fair that's going on right now. Street parking is tight. So there's a lot up there. And we'll be there for the rest of the summer, just so you know, and moving forward. Okay, I want to highlight a couple um, announcements here. Women's Coffee is going to hold their next coffee in a more central location in between our two campuses. It's going to be at the Brookside Restaurant on June 12th from 9 to 11 a.m. So uh, visit the group's page on our website, uh, RSVP there. Uh, go have some time together uh, with the ladies drinking coffee. Awesome. 
Uh, Grief Share, our uh, group that is starting for people who have gone through the loss of a significant person in your life, uh, that group is starting on Wednesday at 7 p.m. at our offices. And so that's going to go uh, on throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, please register. Uh, there should be a link on our Right Now page. Uh, VBS is happening soon. Uh, eight days, is that right? On the 12th? Shoot. It is happening. And so there, is st there are still spots available for the kiddos. If you want to register them, uh, get them in, and uh, it's going to be a great week. Uh, also, during uh, the VBS missions time, we've highlighted this previously, but we're going to be helping at-risk kids and youth in the area uh, to help them focus on school and not have to worry about some stuff. Uh, so we're packing backpacks filled with school supplies, and uh, if you would bring those supplies either to church next Sunday or uh, to VBS, that would be super helpful. Lastly, uh, Arts Camp is happening July 17th through the 21st at our Pasadena campus, and so that registration is live. I believe that's kids first grade and up, but that's a pretty cool week as well. All right, those are the announcements that I need to highlight. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. God, we love you. We thank you uh, for the gifts that will be given today and throughout the week, and we will use those for the building of your kingdom. We love you, Jesus. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. And I surrender all No. 
Well, good morning. Thank you very much. I uh, was uh, waiting for that, you know, transitional moment when you broke into applause, and I know you were in that moment because it was very sweet, and you didn't want to be disruptive, so it was just kind of like. So I've been out for two weeks, you guys know, uh, in Africa, and uh, a couple of weeks ago I preached at our Soweto church, and uh, that's a church you guys helped build, and we don't always get to visit there, but we did this year, and uh, it's really interesting to me because, you know, I have to speak through an interpreter. Uh, everybody there speaks English, but the services are in Suswati, so I have a really incredible interpreter, and... Uh, He's the pastor of that church, but he follows me around. Anywhere I have to go when I'm there, he goes with me, and he's a very dynamic preacher, and he's about six foot three. He's a very large man, and so he and I have an agreement, and the agreement is, whatever I say, please make it better. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because I don't know the whole nuance. I can't tell jokes and stuff. I, it's different, so I have no idea how the sermons go. I just talk about anything, and he fixes it and tells people what they need to hear, so it's good. <laughs> but I realize I'm two weeks out of practice, so now I'm back here, and you will actually understand what I'm saying. So I thought we'd talk about something light. So I'd like to discuss the meaning of life. <laughs> that, that work okay for you? What is the meaning of life? Maybe you just ask this question, what does it mean to be successful? What does it mean for you to be successful? And another way of asking the question, which may be more important, is what does it mean to have a meaningful life? Not what is the meaningful, meaning of life, because that's philosophical. But what does it mean to have a meaningful life? And so we're going to give that a little bit of thought today, and, and, and we're talking about maturity, and I'm realizing that Preaching about maturity is kind of like praying for patience. You probably don't want to do it very often because it matters. Ignorance is bliss, but it's dangerous. Maturity is costly, but it's a great antidote to dysfunction. And so we're thinking a little bit about Joseph today and his journey towards maturity and what it means and what that looks like and how that fits together into what it means to have a meaningful life. And so when you ask that question, what does it mean to have a meaningful life or what is the meaning of life, you, you, can, you can have this a very broad discussion. So the existentialists tell us that, that a meaningful life is what you come up with on your own. It's, it's what you figure out inside of you. It's what you understand along the way. By the way, I just saw uh, Herbie Yvonne. Hello. I don't always greet people personally like this, <laughs> but hello. Uh, you know, I can't say this about very many people, but there weren't very many people here when I came here to be pastor, but they were here. <laughs> yeah. In fact, they came to Kansas City when I was still in grad school. Those are the first two people I met from this church, even before I interviewed here. So, and now they live in Alabama. And that's not okay. I don't know. <laughs> I want to tell you a quick story about them. For 35 years, they have contributed to a building fund. 35 years. Every week. <laughs> I, I hope it was gratifying when you walked out there and you just went, they did something with that money. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah. The existentialist says meaning is found in what you make. You just look inside and you make up what's meaning and then you go do it. That seems so dissatisfying to me. Like I just make it up as I go? The Hindus say that the meaning of life is what everybody wants in life is to know, to be, and to be happy. I don't know what that means. I got a lot of questions about that. It didn't answer the question for me. What is the meaning of life? What is a meaningful life? What does it mean to be successful? What do you think it means to be successful? 
And then let me follow up that question with this. Is being successful the same thing as having a meaningful and fulfilling life? Is being successful the same thing as having a meaningful and fulfilling life? Let me throw a couple of thoughts at you. The first one is this. One of the issues that we have with a meaningful life and success is that we don't get to control the outcomes. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we got to control life? Wouldn't it be nice if we somehow could do certain things and say certain things and live certain ways and pray certain prayers, and then the outcomes would be controlled, be within our ability to sort of manipulate it? It's part of what adds to the difficulty of this conversation. And here's another fact. Well, not only do we not get to control the outcomes, but guess what? Life's not fair. It's not really fair. Things don't always turn out in a fair way. And so with those things thrown in there, it means that we have a lot of questions about what it means to live a meaningful life, what it means to be successful, how that all fits together, and how that all works. And the truth is, that understanding leads to all kinds of dysfunctions in our lives and in our relationships, in our inner world. Sometimes we're just frozen with confusion, and, and, and we feel stuck, and we feel unhappy, and we feel lost in this journey of life, and then that spills out. <laughs> It spills out in our relationships with others. It spills out in our relationship with God. It has a big impact on who we are and how we function. So here's some wisdom that's been handed down for us. Some great quotes for you to think about. All you need in life is ignorance and confidence. (laughs) And then success is sure. Mark Twain. Something to be said for that. I mean, most of us, when we started out, we were a little ignorant, weren't we? And we charged ahead with confidence. (laughs) Had we known what was coming, (laughs) we would have been less ignorant and way less confident. (laughs) But together, that kind of pushed us forward. Success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Winston Churchill. Now, I grew up, I was born in 1960. Thank you. And... uh, That was the birth, that was John F. Kennedy just got elected in 1960, and he started, we were in a a race with Russia to put, you know, objects in space, I know, some of you remember, and uh, in 1960, John F. Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon, and in that decade then, we watched failure after failure, publicly watched, on on the big screen, the failures that were happening over at NASA. Collectively, as a, as a country, we watched, but we watched out of those failures successes, and by the end of the decade, they had put a person on the moon. I don't know that our modern culture embraces failure very much. I think there's tremendous pressure, especially on young people, to hit the ball out of the park every time, to figure out what you're going to do and what you're going to be and go be it, but that's not really how life works. In fact... I love that quote. Success is going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. you got to have a way of bouncing back, of having some kind of resilience, of knowing that, that while ignorance is bliss, maturity is costly. I don't know. I've said this over and over through the years, but I would be happy to be immature and happy. Anybody else? I don't need to be deep. I'll be shallow. But life defies that, doesn't it? What's terrible is to, you know, not be shallow and not be happy. That somewhere there's a place to go. That when life begins to teach us lessons, we dig in and we figure out something. And something gets birthed in us. And I think that something is maturity. And it matters. Success is to be measured... Not so much by the position that one has reached in life, but by the obstacles which they have overcome. Booker T. Washington. That's a whole different slant, isn't it? That's a whole different issue. I think when we look around at one another and we kind of go, well, I don't know if I'm successful or not. I don't know what it means. You know, we sort of have a standard of success in our culture and in our world. By the way, you are all madly successful. I'm going to say it again. If you're watching online, if you're in this room, you are madly successful. 
I just, in these last couple of weeks, you know, you, you, you get immersed into a space that is almost hard to imagine. I, I'll give you one very personal example. My body right now is sore. I have driven on roads that no human being should ever navigate. In this country, if there's a road with a pothole, we have problems. Like we can't steer around it. We're just like, what has happened to the infrastructure of our world? You go to Africa, I'm going to tell you something. You will be beaten to a pulp. I mean, just, just something so simple. I've stood in homes in these last few days where people have not had a decent meal in days and days and days and days. Visited with a woman who couldn't take her blood pressure medicine because she had no food. And she couldn't take the medicine without food and she had no food. We are tremendously, in this world, in this culture, in this space, successful people. But I'm not sure we feel it or celebrate it. And part of that is because Success has something to do with what we've overcome. And some people overcome very little, and they, they attain very high positions. And some people overcome incredible things, but they don't look like their life's done much. But the measure of success is what you've overcome, not just your status, not just what you've achieved, and it matters. That's another way to think about it. I like this one. Success is getting what you want, but happiness is wanting what you get. Do we? Now, we can't do a lot today just to kind of figure out exactly what, you know, how to fix everything in our lives and in our journey, but we could spend a little time thinking about what it would be to be more happy with the lives we have, more appreciative with the lives that we have. Let's talk for a minute about Joseph. We left him last week uh, being thrown in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was thrown in prison. Potiphar's wife accused him. Uh, of assaulting her, and because of that, he was thrown into prison. And so the story begins kind of there. He's thrown in prison, and he somehow finds favor with the captain of the guard, and he rises to a position of responsibility. In our day, it would be a trustee. He has responsibilities. He helps take care of the other prisoners. He helps run the place. Uh, he has keys. He, he goes from place to place. He has a high level of freedom, sort of uh, disproportionate uh, to some of the other folks there. And we're told that on one occasion, the king gets mad at his cupbearer, and he gets mad at his uh, baker. And so the two of them are thrown into jail. And in the morning, as um, he's making his rounds, uh, he comes across the baker and the cupbearer, and they're both sad. And he says to them, you're not your usual cheerful selves this morning. What's going on? And uh, they both say, well, we've had dreams, and we have no one to interpret them. And so we don't know what they mean. And he says, well, God's the interpreter of dreams. Tell me your dream. And so the cupbearer says there, were, there were, it was a vine and it grew out of the ground and there were three clusters of grapes on there and, and the grapes matured and then they were placed in my hand and then I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and I handed him his cup and he says, oh, well, the three clusters of grapes represent three days. In three days, you will be restored to your position as the cupbearer to the king. And the baker said, that sounds good. <laughs> I had a dream too. And in my dream, there were three baskets of base baked goods on my head. And the birds were eating the baked goods out of the baskets. And Joseph said, well, the three baskets are three days. And in three days, the king is going to call you up. In fact, what he says is, Pharaoh will lift up your head. <laughs> and then he will take it. And he will hang you on a pole. And the birds will eat your flesh. Not as good of an outcome. And Joseph says to the cupbearer, remember me before Pharaoh. I am here unjustly. I was sold into slavery by my brothers. I have been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. I shouldn't be in here. Remember me to Pharaoh. And the cupbearer, sure enough, three days later, it's the Pharaoh's birthday. He lifts the head of the cupbearer and the baker. The cupbearer is restored and the baker is not. And the, the cupbearer forgets all about Joseph. This is a tiny little phrase, but to me it's such an important one. Two years later. <laughs> two years later, the Pharaoh has a dream. 
and he's upset, and the cupbearer comes in in the morning, and he sees that Pharaoh's upset. He says, what's going on? You're not your usual cheerful self. And Pharaoh says, I've had a dream, and, and I don't know what it means, and there's nobody to interpret it for me. And the dream goes like this. I was looking at the Nile River, and out of the Nile River came seven cows, and they were fat, and they looked wonderful, and, and, and they came out of the water, and then they began to graze on the reeds along the river. And then seven more cows that were lean and ugly, they looked malnourished, came out. And they ate up the seven healthy cows, but they didn't get any fatter because of it. And then I had a second dream. And the second dream was I, I saw a wheat field. And on this, on this shaft of wheat, there were these seven heads of grain that were beautiful and bountiful and healthy and good. And, and then there was a, 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 another set of grain, and it was scorched and withered, and it looked awful. I don't know what it means. And the cupbearer says, oh, I realize I've been negligent. Two years ago, you were upset with me and the baker, and you had us thrown in jail, and there was a Hebrew there who interpreted our dreams, and just like he said, it all came true, and, and the Pharaoh said, send for him. And we're told that Joseph is bathed and shaved and put in clean clothes, and he comes before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh repeats the dream to him. And Joseph says, God is the interpreter of dreams, and this is what it means. The seven cows are seven years of plenty. There will be seven years of bounty, there will be seven years of abundance, and then the seven lean cows represent seven years of famine. The, the second dream is just like the first one. It's seven years of abundance. It's seven years in which everything will thrive, and then the seven years in which there'll be famine and loss. Pharaoh, what you ought to do is you ought to, in the seven years of abundance, you ought to gather all the grain you can and put it in storehouses so that when the seven years of drought come and famine comes, there'll be plenty of food to eat. And Pharaoh says, can we find a man equal to this? I am putting you in charge of everything. In fact, here's the signet ring of the Pharaoh. You will be second only to me, and you will be second only to me in name. What you say will be done in this kingdom. Now, we're not at the story of restoration quite yet, but that's not a bad day. That's not a bad day. And what has happened in this story, which, by the way, is about Jacob and his family, who is the father of Israel. You understand where we are? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, Jacob's ten sons and two grandsons become the twelve tribes of Israel. We're talking about the head, the start, the beginning, God's work in the whole world is this dysfunctional family. Jacob's name means deceiver. We've already had generations of dysfunction going on in this family. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery out of jealousy. And somehow along the way, Joseph has gone from a kid who didn't practice much wisdom or common sense to a person of great maturity. Ignorance is bliss, but it's costly. Maturity is hard but it's a great antidote for dysfunction. I see five things that are happening in Joseph's life that would be what I would think about as the core of maturity. Number one, he's learned to be patient. Really, the double whammy when you preach a sermon on maturity and his first point's patience, I'm going to have a hard week. <laughs> Psalms 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand, and he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to my God. Patience is a huge antidote for dysfunction, and I want you to let that sink in. I, I would guess that right now, for some of us, our inner world is a mess. We're full of anxiety. We're full of stress. We're full of worry. Patience. Patience, patience, patience. We have relationship stuff that's not working. I don't know how many of you have lived this, but did you, do you remember, some of you, <laughs> you thought one day, you know, your kids would be grown 
and then you, you would start to simplify your life, you know. The, the kids would go away to college and they would get married and they would have a life of their own and your life would be simpler. Anybody live that fantasy? And then your kids grow up, and they get married, and they move out, and this is what you find out. You have more people to worry about, and you have zero control over them. <laughs> I mean, don't you want your adult children, don't you sometimes want to take your adult children and say, I'm spanking all of you. <laughs> Some of your adult children are in the room, so you're all going, no. <laughs> Mine are wonderful. No, my kids are great, but, but you realize that as they navigate issues in their lives, you want to help and you want to fix it, but you can't. You can't. And out of that stress comes dysfunction, because as parents, we're not always the smartest people. We, always, we, 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 we have a tendency to say things we shouldn't say, to compare their lives to our lives, but their life is not our life. Their world is not our world. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the miry clay, and he set my feet on solid rock, and he gave me a new song to sing, a song of praise for my God, patience. Patience is an antidote for dysfunction. Just be patient. Just be patient. Just be patient. Number two, endurance. Endurance. Patience makes us calm. Endurance makes us strong. Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. What was Joseph's big secret of success? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't give up. Be patient. Have endurance. Some of us, we, we, we keep trying to do things, thinking. And by the way, there's a lot of this theology floating around. If you do the right things, God will take care of everything and bless your life. That is true up here. Down here, we're a lot like Joseph. I did all the right things, but all the right things did not happen. I did all the right things, but I'm still in jail. I did all the right things, but it didn't all work out the way it was supposed to. Now, ultimately, it all worked out. And ultimately, for you and I, it'll all work out. Not all of us will enjoy that reality in this life. <laughs> but we're taught that what we do here matters because what we do matters beyond the days of this life. Endurance. It's an antidote for dysfunction. I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to be calm. And I'm going to be tough. I'm going to keep going. Number three, commitment. Commitment. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Joseph maintained his commitment, even when he couldn't really see that what he was doing was having any immediate result for him. He, he kept praying. He kept doing what he know, knew was right. He stuck to it. He was committed to doing the right thing for the right reasons, and he stayed with it. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep doing the right thing. He just kept praying. He just kept trusting he kept making choices that were good choices. He kept learning from his mistakes. He went from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. And that matters. And some of us, we're not that resilient. <laughs> We've forgotten that life is a lot of failure. There's a lot of it going on. We've begun to live in a culture that's, that's going back decades to find failures and then canceling people over it. Listen, the grace of God says... <laughs> In all things, I will work for your good. Not all things are good, but maturity happens because we grind through. We grow and we get smarter and we get deeper and we get stronger and we hold on to our commitments because they matter. They matter. Number four, faith. 
Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith. I think if you were to ask Joseph how his life was going, he probably would say something like this. Well, God's been good. I think if you'd have gone to him in prison two years after he had interpreted the dream of the cupbearer, I think he would have said, God's been real good. I think he would have told you a story like this. Well, listen, my brothers were going to kill me. And God spared my life. And they sold me into slavery instead. And I was bought by this man Potiphar, and he esteemed me. (laughs) And I was given a place of responsibility and prominence in his home. And that turned out bad, because sometimes people make bad choices in life. Sometimes there is injustice and unfairness. That's a part of it. Sometimes the world does not work the way we wish it would work. Amen? Amen? But that's not the story. I was thrown in prison, and God allowed me to find favor with the captain of the guard. And I rose to a place of responsibility and trust. And because of that place of responsibility and trust, I was in a place, no means of my own, no working of my own, where the cupbearer of the king asked me to interpret a dream. And I prayed to God, and he provided me the interpretation of that dream. And that interpretation of that dream to that guy two years later resulted in an audience before Pharaoh. And there was another dream. I didn't instigate it. I didn't dream it up. I didn't work for it. It just happened. Pharaoh just had a dream that he didn't understand, and the cupbearer was sending in the right place at the right time and remembered me, and I showed up because in all things, God was working for my good. In fact, Joseph is going to talk about his philosophy of life in a few chapters, and this is what he's going to say. What you intended for evil... God used for good. That's faith. That right now, no matter what's going on in your story and your journey, God's working. God's working. In all things. I'm going to rescue. I'm going to help. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to wrap you up. Your story's not over. This is a chapter. Take a deep breath. I want you to be patient. I want you to endure. I want you to be committed. And I want you to have faith. Number five, I want you to have hope. I want you to have hope. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I like that at so many levels. I want to be a person of hope. Let me contrast that for you. Have you been around somebody that's hopeless? That's hard. That's hard. It's hard to know what to say. It's hard to know how to help. It's hard to know what words. And we can't fill everybody with hope. But a big part of maturity is being a person of hope. I'm not done. It's not over. Not finished. The story hasn't all been written. There's hope. There's hope. How's it going to work out? I don't know, but I got hope. I don't know how it's going to work out. I believe God's working. And I have hope. And my hope is not limited to the days of this life. It's not limited to the days I walk on this planet. I I have a hope that outshines that. And that hope tells me that what I do and what I say and how I live matters. It matters. I may not be the recipient of all the benefit of my own journey. But how I behave myself and the hope in which I live rubs off on people. Amen? Amen? Or the hopelessness rubs off on people. And sometimes it's so easy to look around our world and and to look around our culture and to look what's happening and forget this is my father's world. It belongs to him. He created it. I'm an ambassador of reconciliation. I am salt of the earth and light of the world. And if I'm not filled with hope, I'm not going to do well with that. So I'm invited into this place of maturity. And maturity is an antidote for dysfunction. And it doesn't have to wait. Today, we can walk into circumstances in our own lives and we say, you know what? I haven't been as patient in these circumstances as I ought to be. And that's a mark of maturity. And I want to be a mature person. And I'm going to start to practice patience. I'm going to admit that I don't know all the answers and I don't know how to figure it all out. And I don't constantly have to be trying to shape and mold. In fact, 
probably what I need to do is let go of some things and trust that God's at work in them. And because he's at work, I'm going to endure. I'm going to be calm and I'm going to be strong. And I'm going to let that strength come out of my mouth. It's going to come out of my attitude. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't look good right now. But I, I, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to keep doing. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to put another foot in front of another foot. And I'm going to take another step. And I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. I'm not. I'm going to maintain my commitment. I'm going to do what I know is the right thing to do. If it's not reaping one bit of harvest right now, I'm still going to plant those seeds. I'm going to stay committed to do the right thing. Over and over and over, and I have faith that God's working. This is bigger than me. It's not all up to me. It's not all on my shoulders. In all things, he's working for the good, and I trust it. I trust it. I'm leaning into it. God, it's a mess. It would be fun to see what you're going to make of this because it is U-G-L-Y. That's ugly. (laughs) Some of you were struggling a little bit there. And I'm going to have hope. I'm going to be a person of hope. An infectious person of hope. Let's pray. God, we so need you as we think about what it means to be people who are leading meaningful lives. And when we think about what it means to be successful or have a meaningful life, we recognize that A lot of it is related right here into being people of maturity. Maturity inspires us towards thanksgiving and gratitude. It it allows us to be people who are patient and enduring, committed, faithful, hopeful. And so as we close this service, as we sing the words to this song, my prayer is that each of us can just simply do a little work with you. I feel like those watching online, those in this room right now, there's a, there's a whole lot of burdens that need to get left behind. And we didn't come here to just say a few things and sing a few songs and go on our way. We came to be changed, to walk out of here different than we came in. And that passage in Romans says that this hope is born of the Holy Spirit. And I pray your Holy Spirit now would infect hearts and minds and homes and families with hope the real thing, and that we would pursue maturity as individuals, as families, as a congregation. We would seek lives that are pleasing to you so that we might be the kingdom of God alive on earth. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Will you stand as we respond to the word? To Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to you guys. Have a great Sunday.